ten hours ago. Yes. If you were told me ten hours ago that nearly fifty people would still be here and still actively taking part in our presentation, I would have said I would have asked you what you were smoking. <laughs> I really would have. Um, and then if you had told me that by and large the whole program stayed on track, <laughs> I said, no, no, it's a unity program. Yeah, unity right. programs never do that. <laughs> this one did. So I am, I am honored and I'm thrilled. The other thing is, you know, Mark Hicks is a genius. He left it to spirit. He did not assign us topics. He didn't put the topics in any particular order. And everything has worked out just great. I'm amazed. I haven't heard any repetition. I have heard a lot of complementarity. You were talking about the women of the Bible right now, and I'm going to go to the, the root of the whole feminist problem uh, in my presentation. When I was a young man, uh, a Bible pulled me through a, uh, uh, a tremendous challenge, you see. I was a Sunday school teacher, and I was on my way to teach my class, but I was late, and I was speeding, and I got pulled over. I was seriously speeding. And this huge cop is standing at my door, at the door of my car. And he said, where were you going in such a rush? I said, officer, if I told you if I, if I heard the story, I would tell you. Uh, I wouldn't believe it, so I don't expect you will. He said, well, try me. He said, I told him I was going to teach my Sunday school class, and I was late, and my eighth graders would soon be running around the church hall. I'm going to be in trouble. And then he saw the Bible on the car seat next to me. Now, I tell you, I still own that Bible. <laughs> He said, you really are going to Sunday school, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you were driving almighty fast, but you weren't doing anything else stupid, and you aren't drunk. So slow down and have a good day. See, my um, bacon was saved by the Bible, but then I put it on the shelf for years. Um, I actually got very angry with God. I was never an atheist. I just thought God was the meanest SOB in the universe. But of course, the rabbis always ask, who gets to heaven sooner, the one who loves God or the one who hates God? And the answer is the one who hates God, because that one thinks of God more often. <laughs> a lot of people say they'll never forget their first unity service. Well, I certainly won't. I thought it was about the silliest thing I'd ever experienced. Really, I did. Uh, but after about a year of hanging around um, on the periphery of unity, and I only did it because I was in love, you know. If I wanted the relationship, unity was part of it, so it was a price I had to pay. After about a year, I saw that some of these unity people had a quality of life that I did not enjoy, so I, uh, I began to get serious about my study. And, uh, well, the rest is kind of history, except that I became a, uh, a Bible teacher because there was nobody else. All the others had either retired or left for other reasons. And when we, in on the Unity School faculty, the much diminished in size Unity School faculty, began to look around at who was going to teach what, I couldn't stick to just history anymore. It had to be Bible too. And what a delight that was for me. Another delight was, after years of ministry, doing a Master of Arts in Religion degree and uh, dabbling in a secular, not secular, uh, non-metaphysical biblical scholarship. What a combination the whole package makes. When you put it all together, oh my goodness, you really got something. Now, my my presentation is about Genesis, but I have to share with you an insight, uh, what I call almost a fourth dimensional insight, and I'm thinking about taking away the almost. Here's what happened. I was reading in John 10 where they were getting on Jesus' case again. 
The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Okay? He was used to that by now. And Jesus replied, I've shown you many good works from the Father. And by the way, when I say Jesus replied, I always mean words attributed to Jesus. We won't ever know what Jesus' words were. This is the writer of the Gospel of John, Jesus. This is his awareness of Jesus that I'm sharing with you. And his Jesus is a very special Jesus. I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? In other words, no good deed goes unpunished. The Jews answered, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, though only a human being, are making yourself God. Have you ever had that thrown at you? I have. Just last uh, two weeks ago. Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. And there's when the insight started. I said, Where is it written in the law? I had to find it, of course, with the computer Bible. That's easy enough to do. And we'll get to that in just a minute. If those to whom the word of God came were called gods, and, and the scripture cannot be a no, can you say that the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I said, I am God's son? Hmm. They didn't stone him. I mean, later they crucified him, but they didn't stone him. <laughs> <laughs> so, where does it say in the law, I, uh, I, I said you were God? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't say it in the Torah. And it doesn't say it in the Nevi'im, which is the prophets. It says it in the Ketuvim, which is the writings. And here it is. And here's the, here's the thing. Here's, here's where it starts to turn. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. A lot of people read that, and they don't think anything of it. But you see what we've got here? It's called henotheism. There's more than one God, but God is, is the one that's judging all the other gods. Our God is bigger than your God, but we're not saying yet that your God doesn't exist, okay? Then we go down to verse 6. You are God's children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. I saw that, and I, I can't really describe the experience I had. Because it was the juxtaposition of John 10 and Psalm 82 that got something turning in me. If these were Jesus' words, what was Jesus trying to do? If these were the words of the Gospel writer, what was he trying to do? Here's what I think it was. I believe that the Gospel writer, and perhaps Jesus himself, was trying to get us to see, because this is clearly a misappropriation of the passage from the psalm. It, it doesn't fit. The people weren't told they were gods. The other gods were told they were gods. And here, the writer's putting words in Jesus' mouth, applying that to the people. So, here's what I got from it. What I got from it is that Jesus, or the writer, is telling us we're all divine. But because we don't take advantage of the divinity that's available to us, we die like mortals. Now, dying is not an option. I mean, there, there is no uh, option to dying. But do you have to die like a mortal? That's the question. And that's what I call close to a fourth dimensional insight. You do not have to die like a mortal. A death is not an end, it is the turn of a page. This that we call death, it is no more than the opening and the closing of a door. Do you see that? So there is a level here that if I had not had both metaphysics and biblical scholarship working together, I might not ever have seen most of you know who Bishop John Shelby Spong is. Well, he was at Unity Village, 
and I wanted to talk to him, but he's always surrounded by people. How can I get a half hour or so of Bishop Spong's time? I came upon a wonderful idea. I'll volunteer to drive him and his wife to the airport. <laughs> it works every time. He's a captive audience. And we hit a traffic jam, too. <laughs> It made it even longer, you know? Um, and I, I, I shared this this, um, this story with him, and he didn't laugh at me. He wrote me a nice card after. He said, it's a very, very interesting idea. It has no scholarly foundation, of course, but it's one of those, you know, Arsenio used to say, things that make you go, hmm. Yeah, yeah, all right. Now, to the main event. That was the newsreel. Okay. What we have here is a problem and a possibility uh, in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is the bad news. There's a lot of bombs in it until you apply metaphysical interpretation. It's pretty amazing. Uh, just what metaphysical interpretation will do. And then if you go a step beyond the metaphysical interpretation, why well, then you've really done something fantastic. So we've got seven events that I've identified in uh, Genesis chapter 3, written by the ancient J writer. First, we've got the decision and the act. Then we've got the shaming and the hiding. Then we've got the confrontation with the Lord God. Then we've got the Lord God cursing the serpent, the Lord God declaring consequences for the man and the woman, but not cursing them. They didn't get cursed. Only the serpent got cursed that day, and the ground did. Then we have the birth of physicality, and finally we have the sending forth with the commission to till the ground. So let's take a look. The decision and the act. There's a conversation between the woman and the serpent in verses 1 through 5. Any of you ever seen the Bible comic? I saw one once that depicted Genesis 3. And there's this serpent standing on his hind legs, a lot like the Geico Gecko, having a conversation with Eve. And uh, here's the conversation. If I eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I will die. If I eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I will be like God. If I eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I will die. If I eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I will be like God. What the heck am I supposed to do? Now, when I was a kid, maybe when you were a kid, you were taught that humankind was naughty, naughty or eating of that fruit. And of course, if you went to uh, a religious education program like I did, it was definitely an apple. I mean, it was a bishop who proved it, right? <laughs> they don't read the text and see that the fruit is the knowledge of good and evil. It's got to be an apple. I don't know why. So there's, there's the issue. She's really having a conversation with this serpent, and finally she goes chomp. But nothing happens until she gives some to her husband, who also eats. And then they both know that they're naked. I mean, they've always been naked, but all of a sudden being naked is not cool. <laughs> now, all, all of us probably had that phase in our own lives. You've probably seen little one-year-olds, maybe even two-year-olds. Heck, I, on, a, on a beach in England, I saw six-year-olds running around naked and not ashamed. I was amazed. It was, uh, it was just something that I, I hadn't seen before. And then one day, somebody says, put some clothes on that child. And all of a sudden, the child knows, uh-oh, running around with nothing on isn't so good. So that experience is repeated all over again in every life, the shaming and the hiding. They recognize their nakedness and so fig leaves to cover themselves. You know, I used to teach communication at Unity School, and we always called this the fig leaf position when we were getting involved. <laughs> yeah. So then, I mean, the story is, the story is such lovely, lovely narrative. It's such a beautiful story. 
don't think of it being read by scholars. Think of it being told around campfires. The man and the woman hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. Now, this was one heck of a garden, remember. This was a garden unlike any garden we could see today. And, and, and they attempt to hide themselves from God's presence among the trees of the garden. Imagine that. A concept of God that lets you hide yourself from God's presence. These weren't, these weren't stupid people. They just didn't have our background, our education. This was their story. And don't think that we haven't tried to hide ourselves from God too, huh? Sure. So then there's the confrontation with the Lord God. Uh-oh. Where are you? What sort of a God would have to ask that question? <laughs> But we, we ask, we, we see that from 21st century American eyes. We can't go back to almost 800 years before Jesus was born and feel the, the wonderfully primitive culture, the, uh, the non-internet connected, no possibility of a, uh, a projection on a screen culture, you see. Who told you that you were naked? God knew that there was only one thing that could. All right. And then he asked him if he'd eaten from the tree from which he'd been forbidden to eat. And what does the man do? Why, he does what so many men do. He works it on his wife. <laughs> yeah, sure. You make me miss that turn back there. Yes. <laughs> I spelled trick wrong. The Lord God asked the woman what she's done. She blames it on the serpent. Now, here's where we have to stand up a minute for the serpent, because he never gets the chance to explain himself. He just gets cursed. Okay? You know, there's a song that says, sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. The poor serpent, he lost his legs. He had a, you know, sliver along the ground, eat dirt. Not a nice life. So the Lord God curses the serpent and he declares consequences for the man and the woman. This goes way beyond the time out. <laughs> Verse 15 and 16 are very, very important uh, from a standpoint of many of the world's cultures. I will increase your pains in childbirth in pain shall you bring forth your children, but your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. I had a board president many years ago who ran a better women's shelter. And one night the board president was over having dinner at our house. And it was one of those days, you know, we have them whatever we do. She said, it happened again today. The woman came in about three and a half weeks ago, a little bit bruised, very humiliated, so we cleaned her up. We got her some nice clothes. We began teaching her job skills. We, uh, I had a lead on an apartment for her. And today her husband shows up with a bouquet of flowers and a box of candy, and she went home with him. Happened again. And how many women have been told by, I guess, well-meaning pastors, well, honey, that's just your lot in life, and you have to accept it. It's what men do. It's who they are. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. All right? Now, this is serious stuff. I do not, for one moment, mean to be part of it. Not at all. This is one of the reasons why some people walk into our churches and don't ever want to see a Bible because of verses like that. It doesn't get a whole lot better in the ensuing verses. The Lord God declares that the ground is cursed. Why? Because the man has listened to his wife and eaten of the fruit. 
if that wasn't, uh, I mean, if women's self-esteem wasn't already low enough, this would destroy it completely, almost to the point of extinction, yeah? And then he declares that man will eat bread by the sweat of his face until he returns to the ground. For remember, man, dust thou art, and dust unto dust thou shalt return. And you know, perhaps, that in many churches in Christendom, every Ash Wednesday, people flock to have ashes smeared on their forehead and to be reminded that they are dust. And that's where they're going after they give up the spirit. And eating bread by the sweat of your face. I love my work. I mean, most of the time. I mean, I enjoy doing what I do. I, I, I do. But have you seen the people on the freeway? <laughs> if you're stuck in a traffic jam, look at the faces of the ones on your right and your left. How many of them are overjoyed that they get to go to work today? I've actually seen a bumper sticker that said, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. You know? The Bible tells us that work's supposed to be hard. And if it's in the Bible, it's got to be true, right? Okay. And then we have the birth of physicality. Yeah, the man names his wife Eve, or I prefer the Hebrew Hava. That's one of Teddy's daughters, too, you know, because she is the mother of all the living. What a beautiful story. And I just hate it that scientists have to go searching for a physical Eve. Why can't they accept the story and let it be the beautiful story? That this woman is the symbol, a sacred symbol of life. And let it be that. And then the Lord God makes coats of skins for the men and the women. Now, I like to ask students, what kind of skins do you think they were? And people say leopard skins, lion skins, bear skins. But I said, what about human skins? Now, it's fun that if you read Bible commentaries, they say the same thing that we do. So that's, that's pretty cool. And then there's the sending forth with the commission to till the ground declaring that the man has become like one of us, Elohim, the divine commission, the many-faceted God. Knowing good and evil, the Lord God sends him forth from the garden to keep the man from eating of the tree of life and living forever. Why didn't God want humankind to live forever? Well, we'll get into that. All right? We have to do a metaphysical interpretation. Something's got to redeem this chapter. I don't want to have to take a razor knife and just, uh, you know, do what, um, what was his name in the second century, who just rebuilt the Bible? Charles Jefferson. No, no, that was, that was not the second century. We're talking about the, one of the first heretics. He took out all of the Hebrew scriptures and most of the New Testament. His name's on the tip of my tongue. Help me out, Laura. I know. Yeah, I do too. We'll, we'll think of it. When you think of it, please blurt it out. Five? Five? Uh -huh. Philo? Anyway, anyway. Origin? Eusebius? No. Eusebius? Origin did the No, Origin was one of the good guys. Yeah. Um, so anyway, now there's a cherubim and a sword flaming and turning at the east of the garden so they can't get back in. And I thought cherubim were these sweet little angels that hung around on Valentine's Day with little bows and arrows, you know, aren't they? Uh -uh. All right, so we have the metaphysical interpretation uh, we want to look at, and let's take a look at the decision and the act. The serpent represents a lot of things, most of them good. The life center, the generative function. Hey, if it weren't for that generative function, this would be a pretty empty room. Yeah. Which is not evil when kept in obedience to law. The serpent, Satan, is sensation. So first the serpent is the life degenerative function. Now the serpent is sensation. And sensation, if you'll notice, was not one of Charles Fillmore's favorite words. Not really big into sensation. 
suggesting to the soul an indulgence in its pleasure beyond the limit of the law fixed by a creative mind, okay? When the soul lets sensation rule its action, the reserve energy, Fillmore says we all have reserve energy, but when sensation is ruling, you know, like when you've had a really good night, one where you really need to take out the seltzer before you go to sleep, the reserve energy is drawn upon, and the connection between the spiritual consciousness and the physical is broken. This causes a person to lose their spiritual connection, and in that sense, they're lost. It causes them to fall or descend into the lower consciousness of sense, and this is his fall. This is, according to the earliest unity metaphysics, the story of the fall. All right. Marcion. Was it Marcion? Pardon? Marcion! Yes. Thank you! Marcion. Marcion uh, wanted to establish a streamlined Bible that only had good stuff in it. Take all the bad stuff out. <coughs> so there is, there, is a, uh, there is a fall in unity metaphysics, but do not despair. You've you got to go through the dark tunnel before you come out into the light. The woman is the heart center, or the love nature, and the garden is the earthly consciousness, and the tree is the connection between the earthly and the heavenly consciousness, the nervous system. The fruit of the tree is the reserve energy, having the spirit of being itself fructifying. Now, that's a Fillmorean word. Yeah, Mr. Fillmore was self-educated, and what a good job he did. He loved big words. So now we get to the shaming and the hiding. <coughs> Figs are representative of the seed of humankind. And sin is the misappropriation of ideas, which leads to sensation. Almost sounds Calvinist, doesn't it? When a man and woman are joined, that is, one in sin, they are unclothed of the garment of truth or Naked. Well, let's take a look at this. First of all, remember that when the woman ate of the fruit, nothing happened immediately. It was only when her husband ate of it too that they had that great realization. And you will see again in other places in Scripture where it is only when the male and the female energy unite that something important happens. Too often it's something that we'd rather not have happened, but it works in a positive way too. Okay? The, the masculine energy, the active energy, the feminine energy, the receptive energy, the masculine or thinking, the, uh, the feminine or intuitive must be working together. That doesn't require two people. They're elements of every consciousness. All right. And naked is not a bad thing until you become ashamed of it. Yeah. And you become ashamed of it when your focus shifts. All right. So the woman discerns that activity and ideas begets knowledge, but the knowledge gained is not necessarily of a divine nature. Love or feeling acting independently of wisdom is not reliable. How true. Wisdom acting independently of love is not reliable either. And the eyes, of course, are perceptive, the perceptive faculty of mind. And unless that perception is established in truth, one sees or perceives duality. I will bet that everybody in this room has had at least a few moments in life when we have moved beyond seeing duality. I will bet that that has happened. Does it happen most of the time? No. But it happens. 
And if it happens, it can happen more often. And when it happens often enough, it becomes the prevailing consciousness, the prevailing consciousness of unity, which I truly believe is the task of the human race. It is the task that is assigned to humankind. So far, it may look like we're not making very much progress. But that's when we look at our immediate surroundings. If we took a long historical look, you'd see we've come quite a ways. All right. Both love and wisdom become involved in a counterfeit knowledge through eating ideas inferior to those pertaining to the divine nature. All right. So the confrontation with the Lord. Um, when a desire of the soul presses for attention, man often gives way to his feelings instead of raising them through wisdom to conform to higher principles. Feeling must be disciplined and refined, and desire for sense pleasures eliminated. <coughs> I'm just sharing what is in our own metaphysical Bible dictionary, and it can sometimes it can sometimes feel like a harsh taskmaster. But we're not done yet. Hang in there with me. When consciousness is purified through the knowledge of truth and thought force is established in harmonious relation to divine ideas, the woman will be joined with man and the holy marriage will again be brought to light. Hear this. Celibacy and asceticism have no place in God's plan for man, uh, and he quotes uh, he quotes Genesis, and he also quotes Matthew. In the last sentence of that section, indescribable joy is the heritage of those who submit their sex relations to God in prayer. Was Fillmore anti-sex? No, he was anti-lust. He was anti-lust. Now agreed that he really thought that the sexual function should be used primarily for procreation and not for recreation, but he was not anti-sex. He was definitely not anti-sex. We also have to look at the culture from which the Fillmore's came. All right. Man, ever seeking excuse for sin, puts the blame upon God for endowing him with sensation. Sensation is a divine creation, and all God's creation was pronounced good. This brings us to the root cause of the appetite that craves stimulants and goes to excess in seeking satisfaction. Here we go. This is as important as tomorrow morning. Through listening to the serpent of sense, we go beyond the limit set by natural law and becomes a glutton and a drunkard of sensation. The remedy is to take up the problem from a spiritual standpoint in the knowledge that sensation is a mental quality and can be satisfied only by cultivating the spiritual side of man's nature. It's heavy stuff. And I can make this PowerPoint available for anybody who really wants to dig down through it. The Lord God curses the serpent. Well, sensation is no longer a heavenly ecstasy, but a fleshly vibration, and crawls upon its belly, eating dust all the days of its life. Any of you ever worked with addicts? Yeah. An addict starts out with a oh wow, and then usually ends up crawling on their belly. Their whole power is gone. It's only the addiction talking. And uh, a spiritual awakening is one of the few paths out. And then the consequences. Instead of Bringing forth ideas in the realm of super substance, the feminine is compelled to clothe her ideas with flesh and bring them forth in earthly consciousness. 
having lost consciousness of God as its guiding light, the soul turns to its highest concept of wisdom, the intellect. In other words, what we have here is the birth of physicality, the Big Bang, if you will, uh, where it all, uh, it, it all becomes physical. The way Fillmore describes it, uh, up to that point, we lived in a spiritual universe governed by spiritual laws. Okay. The birth of physicality, uh, the birth of physicality is, uh, it happens when uh, love or feeling an individual consciousness, um, now wait a minute, let me go back here. Eve represents love or feeling an individual consciousness. The I am puts feeling into what he thinks, and Eve, feeling, becomes the mother of all living. Feeling is the spirit that quickens. Woman represents the soul region and the mother principle of God. Back of the woman is the pure life expression of God. Adam and Eve represent the I am identified in one primal being. They are the primal elemental forces of being itself. I am being. Being me. Okay. We were originally connected with the spiritual body idea, but when we took on personal consciousness, we were given a coat of skins under the law corresponding to the quality of our thought world. The coat of skins, the body of flesh. When spiritual thought becomes supreme, the coat of skins will give way to the manifestation of the spiritual body spoken of by Paul. This was Fillmore's idea, by the way. He did not believe that he would be a 2,000-year-old man walking around in a body of flesh and bone. He believed he would be an eternal being whose body was transmuted without the experience called death. Sending forth with the commission to till the ground? Well, when will becomes independent of wisdom and an unbalanced condition in both mind and body is set up, and we're sent forth to till the ground. It sort of sounds like adolescence, doesn't it? When your teenagers who represent will become independent of wisdom. Okay. And lest he put forth his hand, appropriating the power of mind, and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, using the forces of being toward the expression of a consciousness adverse to the Christ mind, omnipresent wisdom closed the door to the within until man should again enter into the garden by establishing the divine consciousness, Christ the way. Any of you ever seen the movie Death Becomes Her with Goldie yes. Hawn and Meryl oh, Streep and Bruce Willis where they discover uh, Isabella Rossellini has this serum that will allow you to live forever but it does nothing for consciousness so they constantly have to have their bodies repaired and after a while they start looking pretty raggedy. Yeah. Okay. So, if this was all there was to it I could be called, uh, I could be accused of wasting your time for 40 minutes, but it's not. Here comes the good stuff. Well, the garden is the spiritual body in which we dwell when we bring forth thoughts after the pattern of original divine ideas. Okay, now we could say a lot more about this whole process and about whether we would go back to the garden if we could. I believe that humankind cannot go backward. We can only fool ourselves into thinking we can. We can only go forward. We would be pretty bored in the garden if we ever got back there. All right. The East is within. Uh, the flame of the sword is the divine idea of word of God. When we unite with that word, we get past the angel. So now we're going to reframe the seven events of Genesis and try to do it in five minutes. Here we go. Decision and act. When I take that experience that I had when I just opposed Psalm 82 with the passage from John, decision and act becomes I am alone.
awareness. You see that? It becomes I am awareness. Okay. Having been through the experience of life and overcoming, we put on the I am awareness. The shaming and hiding becomes remembering. When somebody is ashamed, is shame a useful emotion? Not, not really. Responsibility is a good feeling. But one of the things that will help us through any difficulty is to remember who we are. In other words, put ourselves back together. We don't take Genesis 3 as an indictment. We take it as a path to a higher consciousness. We don't shame, we don't hide, we remember. We remember the truth of who we are and we put ourselves back together. The confrontation with the Lord God. A lot of people say Job was patient. And he was up to a point. But then he did a Popeye and he flew in God's face. And he really let God have it. And after we finished letting God have it, God let him have it. And he was reduced to uh, a very humble creature. But you know what happened after that? He was given back everything he'd lost. Yeah. Yeah. God's first con man, Jacob, spent all night wrestling with a man. And the man said to him when the sun was coming up, let me go, because the dawn is breaking. And Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And he blessed him. He also made him limp for the rest of his life. What did he name him? He named him Israel, one who has striven with God and, per, and, and um, prevailed. 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 Thank you. One who has striven with God and prevailed. Now, Jacob didn't keep the name. His people took it over from him. We still know him as Jacob. When we get into God, when we engage God, when we shake our fist at God, if that's what we need to do, then the road to oneness opens up to us. All right? The Lord God curses the serpent. We can see past a curse to a blessing. The blessing here is the restoring the rehabilitation of respect for the physical nature which Christianity forgot for centuries and is now remembering. All right? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with our physical nature. There never was. The consequences? For the man and the woman, well, they turn from me into release of any remaining belief in separation. That's the fourth dimensional view. When the man blames it on his wife, she blames it on the serpent. They stop, reframe, and all of a sudden, there is a new view. The birth of physicality is really the birth of fourth dimension awareness where we know that yeah we have a body and it's a body to cherish to love sometimes to apologize for for the way we've thought of it and the way we've uh, treated it thank you Mary Fillmore for teaching us that but we aren't a body we are much more than that body you see So there we are. Sometimes it's the toughest Bible passages, the ones that I would like to carefully slice out of the Bible and put through the shredder and pretend they were never there, that offer the deepest insights. What do we have to do? Engage them. Go through the steps of metaphysical interpretation, even the unpleasant steps and look for the treasure 
that lies just beyond. How often do we give up before we get there? And how often is that giving up happening just before we get there? Those are the questions that I ask you to consider. Is this, is this approach completely scholarly? No, it's Tom's, it's mine. I own it, I, I love it. You'll have your own approach. My job as a Bible teacher is to help people take back the Bible, to use it on their own terms, to use it as it will bless them. And some Bible teachers have said to me, well, that's very convenient. And the ones that are uh, more amenable to discussion, I've suggested to them, aren't you doing the same thing, but just simply making different choices? The Bible is a living document because it is a record of human consciousness, almost from the time human beings were able to record their thoughts and feelings. Humankind, I believe, is innately religious. We are constantly creating an image of God, and that image of God is constantly needing to be recreated. So here we are, a gloriously diverse group of us, each with our own uh, expression of God, each with our own experience of God, and each having spent a really long day working together. <laughs> It, does this present a possibility for our unity movement? And does our unity movement present a possibility for the world? I think so, and yes. I hope you do too. Namaskar. How do we get copies of it? Yeah, I will, um, I will make sure that Mark has a copy. There's nothing on there that's copyrighted, so uh, he can distribute it as he sees fit. And you can probably call calls in the scholarship, and that's OK. And that's fine with him. Thank you. That's how we will grow. I will make sure Mark has a copy. Thank you. I will email it to him tonight. Yeah, and, All right. and Mysteries of Genesis is, you know, I, I'm I'm reading it again for the first time. Yeah, and right. It's, There's it's, a lot of stuff there we didn't see the first that's time. Right, isn't there? That's right. That's right. Oh, I've read it multiple times, and each time it's, it's new. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else? I I love the title, and I love how you uh, make me think that that's what happens. Problems and possibilities are yeah. always come together. They do. And the, the fact that we have the problem means that there is a possibility, right? Who was it this morning that talked about the physical scientist who is using nanotherapy to treat cancer? Yeah, she, she, she left for the airport. So there you go. That problem's been around, but the possibility has too. Sometimes it takes a while for the possibility to be discovered. Yeah, and, and of course it's kind of like the bare one over the mountain. We get new problems when we discover possibilities for the old one, but it's all part of the other path. Yeah. The thing I uh, see sometimes with the unity is people want to do away with the problem yes. and hold on to the possibility. And what you're saying, this, is, this offers something for the unity movement. Do you think people will begin to accept that problems happen? If we want to be real, we'll go, oh, we can still use the word challenge, but sometimes you've got to say problem. Yes. You know, and I never do a memorial service or a funeral without saying at least once that the person died. Right. Yeah, you know, sometimes unity people don't want to see that. <laughs> I have, in my more um, pithy moments, uh, said that we in unity sometimes have confused absolute good with absolute nice. But one is wonderful, the other not so much. Okay. I have one more question. Sure. It kind of goes back to what um, uh, Dr. Laura was talking about earlier in the new problem and possibility, demons and angels. Um, one of my uh, colleagues says that God is duality, that God is both light and dark, and that we do a disservice to God 
by saying God is all right. What do you think about that? I think it's a question that really deserves uh, further investigation. You remember the scripture that says, I make wheel and I make woe. You remember also that Satan is not a Hebrew origin. We have Satan thanks to the Zoroastrians. So the earliest Hebrews really wanted, really believed that it all happened because God decreed it. So that's a question that is worthy of deeper discovery. Wouldn't it be fun to have uh, meetups or online discussion groups to discuss issues like this? I think it would. I don't have a final answer for you is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, anything else? Well, in 10 minutes, we get to bring it home. We save the best for last. We'll hear Mark Hicks.